Spiked is producing more content than ever. The best way to keep up with everything we do is by signing up for our daily newsletter. It's called Today on Spiked. Every weekday, you'll get a roundup of all of Spiked's content, plus some exclusive commentary. So never miss a thing on Spiked. Go to spiked-online.com slash newsletters and sign up to Today on Spiked now. Hello and welcome to Culture Wars with me, Andrew Doyle. You'll have noticed that Charlie Hebdo, the French satirical magazine, has been back in the news because of a controversial front cover image which depicts the Queen kneeling on Meghan Markle's neck. And obviously that is an image that invokes the death of George Floyd. So it's caused quite a stir, as you can imagine. So I thought it would be quite interesting to talk to someone from the offices of Charlie Hebdo. So I'm joined today by Robert McLean Wilson. Robert's a novelist from Northern Ireland who joined the magazine just a few months after the horrific attack in January 2015 in which 12 people lost their lives. I first came across his work because of a really fantastic piece he wrote in The Observer in which he defends the cartoonists of Charlie Hebdo against the allegations of racism. I thought it was very interesting to hear an insider's perspective on these issues and how the magazine routinely finds itself on the front lines of debates about freedom of speech. Anyway, enough of the preamble. Enjoy the show. And I can say fuck. You can say whatever you want. Yeah. But the thing is, the question I always need to ask is, can I say Diddy Wang? I think we actually draw the line at that one. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, I, this, is, this is the bane of my I, fucking life. <laughs> no one wants to go down the Diddy Wang road. So... It seems as though every six months or so, there's a news story in which people are really outraged about Charlie Hebdo. And usually it's the image on the cover because it's normally people who don't actually read the magazine or who aren't French. And so we end up in this weird cycle where people who have misinterpreted anti-racist satire as being racist because they've taken it on face value, they write lots of tweets, they write lots of articles and condemn it. And then people like you have to come and explain again how satire works don't you ever get tired of that? It's not that I get tired. I, I get kind of depressed sometimes. Um, yeah. Last weekend when the, the fuss kicked off about the cover with the Queen kneeling on Meghan Markle's neck kicked off, I just, I wasn't in the mood and I, my mm. spirits just dipped as in here we go again. But yes, it, it's tedious. It's definitely tedious. Do you want to just clarify from the outset then, what do you say to people? And I know you've made this argument many times. I've read your articles in The in the Guardian, a new statesman, making the point. But let, let's just clarify from, from the outset. What do you say to people who claim that Charlie Hebdo is a racist magazine? Well, if Charlie Hebdo is a racist magazine, it's a very bad racist magazine. The absolutely fundamental anti-racism group in France is a thing called SOS Racisme. And it, its founder passionately defends the fact that Charlie wasn't just a supporter of this group. Charlie was intimately involved in its foundation. Charlie has always been an anti-racism campaigner. They're, they're almost tediously anti-racist. And there's not a lot of comedy in anti-racism. It's nonsensical. Hmm. They are extremely vulgar, extremely rude, but they're not racist. They're so massively not racist that by far the greatest proportion of their covers and their material is given over to making fun of, first of all, the extreme right, which in France is quite uh, important and significant, mm -hmm. but also the Catholic Church. I admit, if you're a devout Catholic, you could have some issues with the cartoons in Charlie Hebdo, which are absolutely appalling on the church. Qu quite brutal on the Catholic Church. Also, it just on God generally, I think, depicting uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in a sort of three-way sexual encounter. That, that is outrageous. As a Belfast working-class Catholic, to see priests with their, their cocks out hassling little kids, I admit that shocks me. But I also have to admit, well, yeah, as, as a working-class Belfast Catholic, yeah, fair enough. That's, that definitely comes under fair comment. So I think you're, you're hitting on something here, which is, of course, we all have things that will will offend us differently, things that we have our particular sensitivities about. That's a very good example. So some of us will have sensitivities about the, the depiction of uh, priests, for instance, and yet we, we're fine with other things. So the, the idea that there should be a sort of benchmark, this is too far, this line should be drawn here, that doesn't really work because of the sheer subjectivity of what people will find offensive. Also, I think people have now forgotten an absolutely 
fundamental part of the, the, the outrage structure, the mechanics of outrage, is that a significant proportion of it is emotional. Yeah. Like, I, I could never watch a John Wick film, me, because I, I tried to watch a John Wick film and they killed a puppy in the first five minutes and I thought, fuck this. I can't yeah. watch a, <laughs> I can't watch <laughs> puppy murdering. I mean, that's an absurd reaction, but it's, it's also absolutely genuine on my part. It, it really, I was angry. I was angry with the filmmakers. They just did that to manipulate me. This is appalling. I know the little puppy didn't die. But you're not really responsible in a sense for your emotionalism. Your emotional reaction is what it is. But then to, to, to try and establish a moral structure, a philosophical structure around it, is facile. And a waste and, of time. And also, I mean, the, the example you've just given is a good one, actually, because the purpose of the brutal puppy killing in the first five minutes of John Wick is that you end up reveling in the revenge. His reaction is utterly disproportionate. He must kill about 300 people in that film. <laughs> but, and, and yet you're rooting for him yeah. because of the, the... So there's a... The, you know, I know it's only a, a Hollywood film, but there is a an artistic purpose to this offensive puppy murder early in the film. It's not just... It's not gratuitous, actually. It has a function. If Tolstoy had done it, I'd be right behind it, of course. <laughs> no, it's fucking Tolstoy. If only Tolstoy had gone into the realm of John Wick. But I think the whole of culture and politics has been ignoring the emotional element for a long time because politics is emotional. Hmm. It's definitively emotional. I feel this way about that thing. That's me in my private life feeling, emoting. But if a hundred thousand of me feel and emote about that thing, that's politics. Hmm. So I don't like the poor. I don't like the rich. I don't like black people. I don't like white people. That for me is my personal attitude, but in a community of me's, that becomes policy, that becomes culture. In our communal expression, whatever it is, whether it's moral, uh, cultural, or f philosophical, we've forgotten that emotion is the basis of almost all of it. Almost all of it. Now, you, uh, just to, we're speaking, you're in the uh, Charlie Hebdo offices at the moment. Not going to tell you the address. I, I, I wasn't <laughs> going to ask for the address, so I, I promise I'll you. I'll ask me the address. <laughs> I can ask anything, but not that. <laughs> now, obviously, it, it will be strange to people to hear a, a Northern Irish voice coming from the, the offices of Charlie Hebdo. Can you, can you tell us how, obviously, your, your background is as a writer, you've written novels, which have been adapted up for the TV, and I have read, I've been reading some of your articles on Charlie Hebdo, well, the ones that are in English, because the Google Translate doesn't, doesn't help the no, common timing, no, to be no, honest. No, 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 no. So how did you get involved with this magazine, and when was that? I started a little bit of writing columns for Libé, the kind of left-wing staple here, a newspaper, Libération. So people knew I was kind of, in the mix a little bit. And after the, the attack in 2015, they just asked me if I, I wanted to do a um, column. And there was no debate. I mean, there was absolutely no debate. I have infinite respect for people who refuse to do something like that because they were concerned about their safety or the safety of their families, but no respect for people who would have done it as a political gesture to refuse. I jumped on it, of course. It seemed to me like it was important that I said yes at that, at that time because Already there'd been the reaction, though it's racist, though it's Islamophobic, oh, it's this and it's that. And, you know, some cartoonists and some writers and a psychiatrist and a historian and a corrector and a cleaner and a cop were just murdered because of cartoons. So there's no debate there. What's the debate? People always talk about the debate when there is no debate. It's just wrong and you have to do everything you can to stand against it. I think that moral equivalence I found very disturbing as, it, it, you know, the implication that they were asking for it, you know, that there should be consequences to satire that involve murder. I mean, and that, that has been the implication in a lot of this discussion. And as far as I'm concerned, psychopaths with guns don't need protection from cartoonists. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's disproportionate. And in a sense, it's simply moral illiteracy. Mm. There is no equivalence. I'm offended. The, the old idea that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, has been lost completely. We're not stoic anymore about criticism, insult, mockery. We think we're going to die. We're wounded. We're triggered. We need the safe space. It is farcical, and, and it's dangerous in the sense that it's making us weaker mm. and kind of sloppier and dumber and all kinds of things. 
So yeah, it's a disturbing thing. It, it's particularly prevalent in the English speaking world. It has to be said. So let's just take you back then. So you you joined Charlie Hebdo very very soon after the tragedy, and as you say, that, so this was for you a kind of the way you describe it. It sounds like it was a no brainer to you. That almost like it was a moral responsibility if you if you've been asked to to show support. And I think there was a broad support at the time. If you remember the Shusvi Charlie signs and the the unanimity among world leaders, but that very quickly dissipated, didn't it? It dissipated a couple of days later. Yeah. How did that feel from your perspective and from the perspective of the people you you met and then were working with? I can't even imagine what it must have been like working in that environment and, and producing work in the aftermath of something so horrific. Well, I didn't really meet everyone for the first few months. It took about four or five months before I started coming into the office because novelists don't get up in the morning and they don't come into offices. That's true. <laughs> so it took a while to meet them all, and I was very surprised by meeting them all because in two thousand and fifteen. Charlie Hebdo was the most famous magazine in the world. Um, there were, it sold 1.8 million copies. There were it was a march of 10 million people all around the world. It was this big thing. But the people in the office were like teddy bears. They were all none of them really cared or noticed, because mm. one of the distinguishing features about Charlie is that everyone's just a little bit shit. I mean, it's not that they're incompetent, but they're just hapless. They're kind of comic. Obama invited. Charlie to be embedded at the White House for a month mm. just afterwards, perhaps embarrassed that he hadn't come to the big march. I'm sure he was busy. And the White House kind of wanted the last say on the cover that would be produced. And so everyone here said no. And I lost my shit. And I went, of course he wanted the last word in the fucking cover. It's the first black president in the history of the United States who gets criticized for wearing a tan suit and putting his feet in the desk. Of course he wanted to check that you wouldn't fuck up. Yeah. And they just didn't see that. But they did take a call from the Pope, who'd been a total dick about them. So they're just useless. <laughs> I've never met people who are so unencumbered by thoughts of their public image. They don't give a fuck. And this is not the public perception, though, or at least the perception that's been whipped up by certain publications, including, the, I have to say, The Guardian, which I know you've, you've written for. And who gave us money. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Guardian shouldn't have a single line and it, it shouldn't have a kind of moral style book. So it'll invite a number of different people and different kinds of people from different backgrounds and different views to write for them. So it's fair enough that they'll have pro-Charlie, anti-Charlie, I don't care about Charlie, which they don't have enough. But yeah, there's, there's been some strange stuff, some inaccurate stuff. What we, well, it's only me who really cares about what the English speaking world says about Charlie. They don't even know half the time. Oh, really? So they're not, they're not conscious of all this. They um... laugh. They were laughing on Monday about all the complaints about the, the royal family, the Meghan cover. They were impressed by how polite English people still were because there were so many indeeds. <laughs> You know, you can imagine the mail we normally get, you know, so they, yeah, were, they of course, were, of course, we're disappointed in you. So let's consider that. Let's just get specific about this. So let's have a look at the, the cartoon that has caused all the, the fuss this time. So this is an image of the queen looking quite demonic in her facial expression yeah. with her knee on Meghan Markle's neck. And the, the headline is why Meghan quit Buckingham. Yeah. And the answer coming from Meghan is I couldn't breathe anymore. Yeah, that's a better translation than we got most of the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> well done. Obviously, it's, it's doing a number of things here. And, and I think the, the obvious thing to say about this is that it is an anti-racist cartoon. It is, in fact, quite openly accusing the royal family of racism. I, don't, I think that's quite clear. I think it's also, at the same time, uh, satirizing the narrative of victimhood that has been pushed through Meghan, as in to compare her to the victim of that horrific killing. In a sense, I hope so. I'm, I'm not sure that's clear enough. Well, I mean, I would, I just would have thought that there's something when you watch the interview with, with Oprah and, and Meghan and Harry, and you're just struck by these, these millionaires sitting in this estate, she's wearing a $5,000 dress, uh, talking about how oppressed she is. And I think the way that that has been treated has been on a par to someone like George Floyd, who's actually lost his life. I mean, it's not comparable. And, and I think that that is an element of that cartoon. It's definitely a parody of the Queen looks like Derek Chauvin. And actually, strangely, it is the French word for a bigot. Is it really? Yep. I, th it's so strange that that hasn't been picked up on. Yeah, well, so strange. You know, people don't read anymore. They don't <laughs> know anything. And what's peculiar about it is I didn't detect enough satire of Meghan because what really struck me here in the office was everybody believed what she said here. And I came in worried that people would be like, oh, no, it's bullshit. She made it up, which quite a lot of people have been saying in private around the world. 
and it has been a, a kind of undercurrent in quite a lot of right wing press comment mm-hmm. is that she just made it up out of whole cloth. But here they, they all buy it. Um, completely. Is that just pretty typical of because the magazine is so consistently anti-racist that th- this is quite normal for them? Would you say? Well, yes, but it's also I think uh, because it sounds actually a bit like French racism. Every country is right, racist in its own different way, and Americans are insane, really, about this subject. They're obsessed. They don't think about anything else. But you can definitely compare France and Britain. And it's incredibly different. It's extraordinarily different. It's so different in that way Mm. that I can't explain French racism to British people. I can't really explain British racism to French people. It's too, it's too hard. They think I'm making it up. I remember trying to explain to the British that I'm going to call uh, Maghreban people, um, people of of Muslim extraction here, Arabs, because that's what you do in French. And that's what such people call themselves. Mm. It sounds odd to an English person, but it's just what you say. And I tried to explain to British people how Arab people didn't call themselves French. So I remember being at a football match and before we went in, we were a little late. It was four of us and we were waiting for another guy. And I said, come on, let's go. We're going to miss the kickoff. And they said, no, no, we're waiting for the French guy. On a ton of français. And I thought I'd missed something in French slang, but no, it was me, two black guys and an Arab. And they were talking about a white guy. And mm. I tried to explain to them how you would never hear two black Americans saying, no, we're waiting for the American, or much, much less likely to black British guys saying, no, no, we're waiting for the Brit. It's just unthinkable. And that thing that the nationality is neither claimed nor defined here changes everything. And British racism is a, is a lot more euphemistic, a lot more casual and emotional than the more systemic form here. So they looked at that. You could easily say, a person in their 60s or 70s could easily say to an expectant mother of a, a racially mixed couple, what color ah, What color is the baby going to be? And they could say that on the metro. I've heard much worse. Yeah. People despise euphemism, so they just come out with it. That's very interesting. And, and also there is this, you know, I mean, when I, when I watched the interview, my thought was, I don't know what happened. You know, it's perfectly possible that two people can remember a conversation in a different way. We don't know the context of that quote we don't know whether it was in humor or or whatever it might have been we don't we just don't know we don't even know who said it so i think it's not a question of disbelieving someone's claim that they experienced racism it's it's about not automatically assuming that that account of it is what happened is accurate because for racism to exist there has to be racist intent and that absolutely has well, not been no, established I, I don't i don't think that's true i think racism can be reflexive unintentional It can be inherent, it can be built in. What troubles me about this is even racists thought that the George Floyd murder was repellent. Even racists aren't going to be mean to a child. So even racists are going to hesitate before saying something about a fucking unborn child. So it's peculiar and it's discombobulating, it's disturbing to everyone. Because it's so visceral. It's like someone said that about it, you know, baby. Well, I think we, we, we do fundamentally disagree on that. I don't think it is possible to be racist without intent. I think intent actually is at the heart of racism. And I, whatever stance you, you take on that, my, my view of this is that I don't know what happened because I wasn't there. And that even, even the people who were there might have different perspectives on what happened. That's what I'm trying to say. Christ, you know? yes, a million times over. I mean, Jesus, fucking Christ. Yes, some Twitter fucking outrage is not proof of the word witness has lost its power as well you know the the idea that i that i have a feeling or a presentiment about something means that i hear a rumor or or an assertion of fact and i go i can react to this with total Mm -hmm. conviction because yes it exists there in twitter on the world uh, in the media people have lost their skepticism yes we weren't there we don't know in a sense, you're saying that the, the satire, the cover, the, the cover that's caused for the first, in a sense, could have gone further with its satirical representation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and in fact, you could take issue with the representation of the royal family as being inherently racist. You could say, well, you, we don't know that either. But there's all sorts of ways you could take issue with the cover. And there's certainly all sorts of reasons to feel offended by it. I think if you were someone who was very emotionally affected by the George Floyd killing, the image in of itself would be sufficient to to cause upset. Yeah, and and, and there were sincere objections because of that, which you had to kind of, to some degree, respect. Yes, 
They're not making that up. They're not exaggerating it. They are upset about that. And that's yeah. kind of fair enough. But there were also a, an awful lot of people, including Americans, upset that in the cartoon the Queen had hairy knees. Oh, really? That was yeah, the, that yeah, was, the that thing was that like a them. huge thing. <laughs> and, and they were going, the Queen doesn't have hairy knees. To which you can only answer, well, how do you know? <laughs> what is your relationship with the Queen that you're up to date on her personal grooming regime? I've never seen her in shorts. I don't know oh, I whether have. she waxes her knees or, <laughs> or not. To be honest. <laughs> You're listening to Culture Wars with Andrew Doyle. If you're enjoying the podcast, please make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can subscribe to the podcast on all the major apps, including iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and more. And if your provider allows you to, then why not give Culture Wars a rating and a review while you're there? It would really help other listeners to find us. Now, back to the show. But I think we can reach a consensus that actually pretty much any image that that the magazine could publish could potentially cause offence and that that offence would be genuinely felt. I think the, 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 the question then is, but that in of itself is not sufficient to to prevent someone from publishing those images. And more to the point, this is part of the satirical tradition, such as I understand it in France. And it's always been in your face. It's not always subtle. It's meant to give you that jolt. And, and in fact, to be uncomfortable is part of this the experience, isn't it? Well, as you'll know, that tradition is actually British. The the harshest cartoons, perhaps, in the history of cartooning are William Hogarth, yeah. who did a series of cartoons about working class life in London and the Gin Lane cartoons, which are vicious, which are yeah. so extraordinarily harsh. And they are like the Will Self end of things. We talk about punching down this new bullshit thing that's now, like it's been around for a hundred years. No, it's completely invented. You punch everywhere as a satirist. There's no up or down in that. So the the, the working class, drunken, bad mother, um, jobless, violent people depicted in the Gin Lane drawings would seem mm. to be the targets. But actually, the targets were the privileged of London who could live a life without seeing it. So it was easy to deny. Less than it is actually now, but still you could you could live a life without going down to Deptford or Catford. And so your your reality of London was very different. And that's why, in a sense, they were so shocking, because they had to be that aggressive to make their point. But they're jaw droppingly mean. Yes. And I suppose there's two problems here then, isn't there? First the first problem you have to face quite often is that people are misinterpreting the work, right? So there's that. And they often think that the subject of the cartoon is the same as the target of the cartoon. And we saw that, for instance, with the, the cartoon you'll recall of uh, the, the refugee child, yes. uh, Alan Kurdi, which yeah. is obviously an upsetting image. It's a drowned refugee yes, child. It's, it's, a, it's a horror. It's, it's a horrific image. But of course, it's a very literal minded interpretation to say, well, the cartoonist is pointing at that dead boy and laughing. Well, because everyone loves to make fun of dead children. Of course, that's the, that's the one you're going to go to. No, of course it is making fun of the total <laughs> hypocrisy of European reaction where it's, oh, oh, dead child, let's close all our borders. I mean, a lot of the people who are objecting to those kinds of things would actually find the stance of Charlie intolerably left wing. They would have more of a fight if they knew about it, about that, than the fact that we're racist right-wing motherfuckers. It's just beside the point. But even without the bad faith elements, and, and there was a famous cartoon of Christiana Taibira, who was a government minister who was black in Charlie, where she's depicted as a monkey. And the New Yorker ran a piece that week in 2015 after the attacks, written by an asshole, saying, look, Charlie depicts black people as monkeys, look how racist they are. But of course, they cut off the legend, the caption, which showed that it was a satire of the fact that a right-wing Front National magazine had used this image mm -hmm. without humor to show her as a monkey, this extremely accomplished French minister who came to the funeral of two of the cartoonists because she was so offended that we depicted her as a monkey. We depicted the the viciously 1930s German propaganda image of her in the, in the right wing French press. But worse than that, worse than the bad faith, well, the bad faith misrepresentations are bad. But I remember very vividly one of my favorite, I hate cartoonists, they're all awful and they smell bad and they're dumb as fuck. But there are a couple of them that are okay. And one of them is Coco, 
And she did a, after the Nice attack in which dozens and dozens of people were killed, including children, when a fireworks show was interrupted by a guy in a lorry mowing down all, all the onlookers. She did a cartoon, a really quite pretty one, which is unusual for Charlie, of beautifully colored fireworks, just the fizz and sparkle in the air. And underneath she wrote Nice, just that. And she got death threats for a month from Russians who, who saw that and read, nice. I mean, fuck me. Fuck me. How dumb do you have to be? This is what frustrates me because this, the simplicity of that kind of misinterpretation and the, you know, and you describe the, the, uh, Christian Tabera as a monkey. And uh, uh, again, the, the target is so obviously the far right. Yes. The target is yeah. so obviously the racist. Yeah. And, and yeah. I almost think there's a kind of, and maybe this is unfair, but I, I kind of see it as it must be willful at this point. Or is it the case that people have just lost the ability? Because I think a child would understand that. An intelligent child would get that. Well, certainly what we notice when it's an English-speaking controversy about Charlie is it always comes two or three days late. So it's not an, actually a reaction to Charlie Hebdo. It's a reaction to something that someone has written about Charlie Hebdo two or three days right. after the magazine has appeared. So. I think this time it was a couple of people on Twitter. There was a girl in London who's like a, a student union kind of activist kind of person, I think. I'm, I'm not entirely sure about that. But a Daily Mail piece and then an RT piece. Russia today. I really? Mean, the wokes in the US are fellow traveling with the Daily Mail and RT. I do see a, a clear connection between this, the literal mindedness of the woke ideology and the reactionary nature of the old uh, right wing Daily Mail style campaigns to have things banned because they, they offended them. I, I do see this correlation there. And that's again about morality. And I, I, I know I sound like Charles Dickens or something. Nothing wrong with that. But I'm obsessed with morality. And what we're currently experiencing isn't morality, it's moralism. And there, there are kind of two ends to, well, there's three because it's about vanity as well and mm. about self-approval. But there, there are two ends to punitive moralism. And one is punitive moralism itself. So you did what I see as a bad thing and you should be punished. And that is, it's kind of the end justifies the means, It's uh, the, the tax must be paid. But there is also sadistic moralism. Mm -hmm. So whatever the, the subject of outrage is, the pleasure isn't even in defining yourself as on the good side of the question. The pleasure is in watching the downfall, is in watching the squirming, the end of the culture, yeah. the humiliation, the abject apology. And that's disturbing and extremely old school conservative. I think there's something in that, but I mean, Nick Cave has described cancel culture, what we call cancel culture, as mercy's antithesis. And it's this pleasure that I see people take. Nick Cave said that? He did indeed say that, yes. Fucking and I think hell. <laughs> that is top drawer. And I think that gets to the heart of it. So often when I see people, what we call cancer culture, you know, a metaphor for just this idea of, you know, continually attacking when someone makes a mistake or offends you or whatever, or has an unpopular opinion, but, but never stopping and publicly humiliating the equivalent of putting them in the stocks, getting them fired, all the rest of it. I always see this barely concealed glee. It's more than schadenfreude. It's, it's, it's vengeance. It's vengeance. And I think that's something that has escalated for some reason. I, I sense it with the recent controversy around the George Floyd cover, because there's this almost gleeful, yeah. this want, this need for the outrage. It's, it's kind of, it's feeding something quite primordial, you know? Anything that is, that is, that has flimsy foundations in a moral philosophical sense will consume itself because it, it needs fuel. And if there is no fuel in, in kind of bedrock actuality, then it will consume itself. Of course it will. It, it needs to achieve altitude. Mm. And I think I'm uncomfortable as an old school lefty with the idea of cancel culture, but I'll, I'll mm -hmm. grant you this. If that kind of thing is at the very least inept, because if you look at race-based wokeism in the United States, they've spent well, like a decade proving to us beyond a shadow of, of a doubt that Mel Gibson is an asshole. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, the rights of black people to vote have been more effectively curtailed in the last 10 years than in the last 100. But we know that Mel Gibson is an asshole. So that seems to me inept. 
one of these things is more important than the other and not the one that has been effectively dealt with. So for you, it's about priorities. Well, for me, it's actually about storytelling because the reason why the prevention of, of voting rights, well, not even voting rights, the practical, boring, tedious business of districting in America hasn't been addressed is because it's boring. It's really fucking boring. How can you do a good solid five minute bit about, about that? There are no good jokes. There's no good color. You're not going to get any decent chat show stand up about that. That's not going to happen. So we don't do it. The subjects for outrage then are those which are most easily publicized, I suppose, those which can be most readily turned into a a shareable story. Is that, that's what you're saying, really? It's amazing how much it, it's about kind of C-list celebrities. It's amazing to what degree it's about people on The Bachelorette or some singing show or some old musician that mm. nobody really cares about. But it's it's what the French call people. It's Paris Match. It's Hello Magazine. That's where if there's a, an ethnicity scandal or something like that, that's where it really sticks. It doesn't mm. stick in the controller of some county in Georgia who's effectively prevented half the black people in the county from voting. No, because that, that's that's not somebody who was in REO fucking speed wagon back mm. in the day. It's it's lamentable. It's absolutely fucking useless. And given this new culture that we find ourselves in. To to what extent do you think the magazine will change its perspective? I mean, are are there conversations in the editorial? I mean, I don't want to get too involved in the the process, but it sounds from what you're saying is that they they don't even anticipate, the cartoonists don't even anticipate this response or just don't care. Is that right? Does it ever cross their mind or maybe this might might press the wrong buttons or cause us more grief that we could do without? They don't. They don't care about that. Certainly, it's not a question of they intentionally want to hurt people or anything like, like that. But they don't. They don't really care about the fuss. They're not always hugely aware of the fuss. One of the youngest cartoonists, Alice, did. <laughs> did. They don't often make me laugh. I have to admit, because they're French. You know. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to be racist about this, but the French well, aren't you've fucking done it now. You've funny. Said it. They're not funny. You've got- You've funny. also said that cartoonists smell. They do smell. Uh, they don't wash. But she made me laugh with this cover, which was about Erdogan, the president of Turkey, who'd been, I don't know, doing his usual thing, which isn't very nice. Yes, it was about uh, Macron and Islam and how they were going to like do something to the French. And she did a cartoon of Erdogan's wife saying, oh, he's really funny at home. That was it. That was it. But because it was Erdogan and he's very popular with Turks living abroad, there were a lot of death threats, except Alice, who is blessed by God, she's like uh, 22 and having a great life and not really caring about anything. She didn't get the death threats. Uh, some other journalist here got the death threats and she went, yeah, that's bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's it. That's that, the that end was of the it. best thing that happened to me for like uh, months. The fact that she just sailed through it blithely, not even that aware. I mean, I, I can't imagine, but like, because it, it, it feels like those sort of threats and that sort of, you know, having to live under these the continual worry of security and and don't you sometimes think i just want an end to this now is it, it, it i mean i it, i don't know how much you can tell us about your experience of of this but uh, what can you tell us anything about this not really i mean I, okay. I i grew up in belfast you know back in the day so i'm used to seeing very large automatic weapons oh yes so that and you know clearly you can imagine it's a bunker um which is, yes and they're all because they're also kind of kind of cute and shambling and adorable and not really very kind of media savvy. It's like working with a bunch of kittens in a bunker. That's really what it's like. Or teddy bears, maybe, that move around. They are racist. I will, <laughs> No, no, seriously, they are racist about what? one group. Go on, tell me. Irish people. Well. You should see what they write up about me on the television. Maybe, the maybe you bring it on yourself. Maybe, maybe um, you do. Yeah, that's possible, yeah. <sighs> Yeah, I, obviously, I'm not going to ask you too much about this. Apart, apart from the address, if you want to give that at the end, we'll, well do Well, yeah, that. it's um, 25 uh, Necker Pants Alley, um, yeah, in, in yeah. 754th arrondissement. I knew I'd get it out of you eventually. Sometimes it hits you. Two things can hit you working for Charlie. Yeah. Sometimes you think about that day in 2015 and you freak out. Yeah. We don't really think about those kinds of events for more than about 30 seconds. And if you do, if you go to the 35th second, you start to freak out as an animal. You start to get the physical reaction because it's unthinkable. Yeah. Does, do you know what a 7.62 millimeter shell does to the human body? It's not fucking nice. As a whole yeah. bunch of waitresses from the restaurants around the Bataclan 
could tell you, you know, 21 year old yeah. girls who held people's heads together as they died in their arms. I mean, that's, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. It's a game changer. But also sometimes the situation and the endless hatred, the endless ignorant hatred that we get and can get to me. Cause I'm, yeah, I'm Irish, but I'm, you know, I'm British. I went to Cambridge and I learned to read the Charles Dickens. I'm sentimental. I'm paternalistic. I have, I have three cats. You know, I'm, I'm soppy. So this kind of thing can, can really bring you down. Well, I think there is something to be said for the way in which, well, what I call cancel culture, you might, you might have a problem with that phrase, but it does have an inherent kind of uh, dehumanizing effect. Obviously, I'm not, I'm not trying to draw a connection between the murderers from the, from the massacre and, and the, the current critics of, of the, of the magazine. But there is this sense in which you're just forgetting that these are, these are good people who have good intentions and, and they're not these demons that you make, you turn them into. They're cartoonists. I mean, I mean, seriously, they're cartoonists. They're, they're, that's like the geekiest, dumbest thing there is. Cart what do you do? I'm a cartoonist. That doesn't get you laid at a party. It's like, does it not? <laughs> I, well, I haven't tried it, but I don't think it would work. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's farcically disproportionate. So you got a, a a bunch of really. Have you seen Kabu's haircut? The, one of the guys who died. I mean, he looked like the uber geek. So they're scribbling away, and then some guys with Kalashnikovs come in and waste everyone that's not those things don't exist in the same world and um, uh, yeah it's uh, but the whole cancel culture thing that you're talking about and what you're talking about the consequences perhaps being of that hmm. i remember last year i bumped into an american girl outside a taba smoking a cigarette and i had started smoking for about a week again yeah in my long campaign to stop and we got talking and she looked exactly like a young Al Alanis Morissette with a hat and the whole kind of hippie, groovy thing. Yeah. And I don't know, she would have been about 30. And she was going to vote for Trump. And I, I was like freaked out. I was, you're going to vote for Trump? And she was going to vote for Trump because Trump was the punk candidate. She was sick of yeah. puritanism and disapproval and the kind of teacher kind of aspect, the, the donneur de leçon, as the French would say, the, you know, the lesson giver. Yeah. And that really freaked me out because I remember the eighties when the labor party was so extraordinarily shit that Margaret Thatcher got elected for 10 years by default. Yeah. Because the lab labor party made being left wing uncool. On that thread, I wrote a satirical video, which was widely shared just after Trump's election. It was the day after. And because it went viral in America, I got a lot of messages from Americans and a number of them, I'm not kidding, said that they voted for Trump, but they had been Sanders supporters. Yeah. So, yeah. And there was a survey as well at the time that a lot of people were voting for Trump because of what they perceived as political correctness. Now we can, we can quibble about definitions and all the rest of it, but really at heart, it is this kind of hectoring, moralizing approach that people are reacting against. And yes, there is this weird subsection of Trump voters who are probably quite left wing and are just seeing it as a countercultural gesture. It's also possibly global because I remember being very shocked about 10 years ago in Marseille, where there'd been quite a strong communist, very, very radical kind of mm. part of the society down there with it got a good communist vote. And the, the activists were working class for once. It wasn't like middle class students. It was, you know, real people with real, yeah. <laughs> with real emotions. And someone tipped me off that in the PMU, the kind of bedding shop bars around the neighborhoods, you go in and get a real good view of something that was happening, which I'd heard of, but I didn't believe, which was communists starting to vote for the National Front. And I right. went in and it was true. It was like, this weird shift that it suddenly happened a bit before America and Britain, but the, the right and left wing um, extremes had, had kind of, the circle had begun to close. Yeah. Where it was the center, the pissy middle-class uh, primary school teacher center that was the most despised. Hi, it's Fraser Myers here. I produce Culture Wars and all of Spike's podcasts. I really hope you're enjoying the show so far. This podcast, like all of Spike's content, is free. There's no paywalls or no paid subscriptions. We rely on the support of our loyal listeners and readers like yourself to keep producing our groundbreaking podcasts, interviews, articles, essays, and more. So 
If you're a regular listener to this podcast and you're wondering how best to support it, please do consider donating to Spiked, or even better, becoming a regular donor. Even £5 per month can make an enormous difference. To start your regular donation today, just go to spiked-online.com and click the red donate button in the top right corner. That's spiked-online.com and the red donate button in the top right corner. Now, back to Culture Wars with Andrew Doyle. I'd be interested to know your perspective about the, the difference here with French notions of, of left and right, which is, you know, obviously it comes from France, but the, uh, in England, certainly in the UK, um, it does feel as though those distinctions have now been muddied uh, uh, in terms of the, the left or what is known and perceived to be the left has been so sort of overwhelmed by identity politics as a priority at the expense of the notions of economic inequality and the class struggle. All of the traditional left-wing ideas have sort of been, they've sort of been abandoned by those who call themselves left-wing. And therefore, to be left now doesn't mean what we think it means. And therefore, you get these confusions. When we talk like this to young people, we sound like we're talking about horse-drawn carriages. I mean, that yeah. is old and gone. I remember with Reese, uh, the boss here, Charlie, we went over to do a piece in, I must have been, whenever the, the last independence vote was in Scotland, we mm. went over to do a piece in Glasgow and around Glasgow. And I remember when I, I was talking to young people about, you know, kind of lefties who weren't voting yeah. Labour, they were voting SNP, which was quite remarkable to a continental European. I remember asking them about, you know, labor, and it was like they felt sorry for this old guy. It was really like I was talking about a horse-drawn carriage. It was gone. It was finished. The British left had always been founded on uh, the union movement, and mm -hmm. the union movement was always incredibly strong in a way that it wasn't here. And that was that was manned by, literally, because there weren't a lot of women in the, in the, in the 60s and 70s, by men so macho and virile that, you know, testosterone used to drip off them. It was incredibly proletarian, uh, self-confident and assertive. France doesn't have that kind of, their syndicats aren't, aren't at all the same, they're kind of middle class. Right. And the death of the, the British left, there's still a remnant of that tradition, but the French left has just died. There is no French left. Dominique Strauss-Kahn, if anyone remembers the guy who was caught in New York forcing a, a hotel maid to fillet him and mm -hmm. arrested uh, for that, he had been the head of the IMF and was just about to become the head of the Socialist Party because being the head of the IMF and being the head of a Socialist Party, it's about the same thing. The French left is beyond champagne socialism. They all have giant flats in the 16th arrondissement and they're all incredibly wealthy and snooty and none of them have ever met a working class person. If I remember rightly, and you're going to have to help me here because I remember the French general election in 2017, there was a, a Marine Le Pen and obviously Macron, but there was a, a leftist who was described as the sort of equivalent of a, a sort of Jeremy Corbyn figure. Do you remember who I'm talking uh, Jean -Luc about? Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Mélenchon, that's yeah. exactly right. So isn't he an example of, of, of the remnant of the old left? He, he is in a sense. Um, I liked him. He had, a, he had a great, one great slogan, which he kind of dropped because it wasn't identity politics, because he's mm -hmm. kind of started giving himself over to that. But he had a brilliant electoral slogan, which was, after 300,000, we take everything which is a taxation slogan. And I, I just, yeah. yeah, I could march along shouting that out. His problem was he's personally not very likable. Right. And he had a, a way of, of, it's very hard to explain, but he, when he was giving speeches, he would talk about les gens, not le peuple ou uh, les Français, mais les gens. So like, you know, them, not even the people, them. Was it ever possible that, that these kind of policies would reverberate, would, would catch on? Or is the atmosphere just not that anymore? Well, the, to be quite honest, white working class people despise the left, the the, the political left, the mm -hmm. liberation, the the people who go on television and, and pontificate about left wing issues. They despise them. They feel completely betrayed and unrepresented. I will grant that. And right. So, in the north of France and in the south of France, they are in increasing numbers going for a Marine Le Pen. Is that partly to do with the rise of identity politics on the left? Yes, it's, I would say it's half that and half just dismay at left-wing incompetence. Right. They really are farcical. They're like, if a not very sophisticated British sitcom that had lazy writers wanted to do a kind of stock 
French aristocratic character. That's basically the entire real life French left at the minute. Right. There are quite a few parallels then in terms of the loss of the, what we call the red wall over here, you know, yeah. the, the traditional heartlands of labor and in France, which I hadn't realized, but you see, the, you can see those parallels. Oh yeah. It's, and, but also much, much worse here. Right. Yeah. Because over here you could, I mean, certainly I think Brexit was part of it, the, the, the labor sort of saying that they would have a second referendum. I think a lot of working class voters felt that their vote was being ignored. So there was the anti-democratic thing. I think there's the intrusion of identity politics into the Labour Party. You know, you even had Jeremy Corbyn charging an extra £10 for white attendees at a conference. Um, <laughs> you, you had the As well the Labour... he should. <laughs> and then the, the Labour, yeah, it doesn't matter how... How much did the have. fucking Welsh have to pay? I would like, like seriously, the Welsh. Yeah, probably, exactly. You much know, different, more. Different rates for the wealth yeah, yeah. and then um, and there was also that pink bus which was meant to entice uh female voters yeah and, you know, i mean women, women you know that so sort of embarrassing. stuff it's so embarrassing it's embarrassing but i think it's worse than that insofar as it's i mean it's funny it's funny on the face of it but it does alienate people people get very resentful and combined with that is a sense of as you say incompetence i think a lot of people started feeling that jeremy corbyn was simply incompetent so it, this sort of concatenation of these various things result in a, a, a disillusionment with the left to the extent that working class voters in the northern heartlands voted tory that i mean that is so unimaginable so unimaginable you the the, the visceral hatred of the tories in the thatcher era it, it, it's difficult to overstate i think just how remarkable that is I, I think it's also because people don't like prissiness and racial scrupulousness racial scruple now means that you have to be prissy it used to be back in the 80s, maybe 90s, anti-racism expressed itself in, I don't care. You're black, you're white, you're whatever, I don't care. But now you have to care. And I think people don't like that. And the only dignified reaction to a racial difference is, so what? I don't care. What, what, what difference does it make to me? You're gay and you want to get married? So the fuck what? But that's gone and people hate. Actually, I think what it is is people hate being forced to give attention to things they don't particularly want to give attention to. Right. Do we all have to read the Quran now in order to justifiably comment? We're having to absorb the life experiences in detail of people who are not interested in us. That's what every group thinks. So white working class people think, I have to give respect to this group or that group. Why don't they give me respect? Because respect now is, is a token of value. It's not a thing that is, it's not restricted to an automatic kind of courtesy or decency. It's an actual presence that has a kind of a moral monetary value. And would you say that you could apply this principle to the satire of Charlie Hebdo insofar as, you know, being an equal opportunities offender? We don't care, you know, who or what you are. Everyone can be in the, a target for, for satire. Absolutely. I mean, my God, I, I'm Irish. Um, so I read Jonathan Swift, you know, a, a modest proposal is one of the most <laughs> wicked texts ever written. It's a <laughs> book for cooking babies. And <laughs> I don't think that many people thought that that reaction to the Irish famine where he said, why don't you eat all the babies was first degree, you know, and it, yeah. its power comes from its deadpan. Its power comes from its lack of explanation. Yes. But also with satire, it, it's not that it's, specific or nuanced because the satire is corrective yes but it is not a proposal so you behave like an asshole a satirist has the best job in the world because they get to say you're an asshole they don't have mm. to offer another option they don't have to say well you know privatizing this or that is wrong but here's my proposal for nationalization they just have to do one part of that job so it is i yes. admit easy yes but there is a thing about it's not about cultural respect. It's not that people have to have some respect for what French satire or French comedy is. It's they have to have some generic humility about themselves. So people who don't speak French should hold their fucking horses before condemning us. Imagine that you're a French person who doesn't speak particularly good English, but some, you have some, which is more yeah. than most English speaking people have in French. And you, you decide, I'm going to watch Chris Rock and I'm going to watch that infamous five minute bit that he does on, I, I can't say it, N-words, the difference between N-words and, and black people. And yes. There's a, there's a long screed of stuff about being burgled and hiding your money in your books. And it's very, very funny. But if your English isn't absolutely perfect, Chris Rock sounds like a psychotic racist. 
Yes. Of course he does. He sounds, he sounds like fucking Hitler. And that's where humility comes in. You have to say to yourself, you know what? I may not be getting all of this. It's yeah. just possible that with my bonjour, voulez-vous coucher avec vous? <laughs> Then I'm not reaching, you know, the, the levels of Voltaire. But I think, though, there is a, an increasing tendency to assume the worst, but not just with satire, actually, even with stand-up comedians. I've noticed this in the UK, that if a stand-up comedian makes a joke about, say, gay people, or with gay people in the joke, the assumption is, well, they must be trying to say something anti-gay. And I think... I suppose what I'd like to do is, I mean, we both agree that particularly if you don't speak French, there are lots of people who are misunderstanding the satire, right? They just, they just don't get it. They, they're, they're basically seeing it through this prism, which is infantile and, and just not on. So, so they're not, they're not equipped to understand it. But let's take their argument though, which is that even if they did understand it, and even if they agree that, that the intention is good and that say, let's say the Meghan Markle cartoon is a, is a, a cartoon that satirizes racists, right? And they understand all of that. What they would then say, is that actually to even joke about the subject is problematic. And they would say that because it normalizes certain imagery and certain ideas. So just to play devil's advocate, what, what, do, you, what do you do with that argument? So everybody likes that um, guy. Is it, uh, he's a Maori actor who's made a splash in America, Taiku Watiti. So yes. everybody loves him. He's, he's made a, a bizarrely sudden and enormous and total splash. Also now occupied that place where you're not allowed to say anything bad about him. So he's Oprah Winfrey, you know, mm, who used yeah. to make anti-vaccination documentaries. And this is unusual given that Jojo Rabbit is a New Zealand, Belgian, but really New Zealander yes. uh, who wrote the novel and then a, a New Zealander Maori guy doing the Holocaust for laughs. And that's yeah. okay. That's fine. I mean, the double standard is good coming maison, as they say here. It's just enormous. It's a standard. That I found very interesting. I did actually hear a couple of critics talking about this who were very upset about it. And we're actually saying that this light treatment of the Holocaust, he was playing Hitler himself, of course, was inappropriate. But the overwhelming response and the overwhelming critical response was positive. And, and, and that debate didn't seem to even surface. And that is odd. He's the first married to get in on the identity thing. So people love him. He's the protected species somehow. I don't know why. I'm sure he didn't actually look for it, but he's now, mm. he can't be criticized. And I would, I would defend his right to make a film about the Holocaust yes, or the troubles in Northern Ireland or whatever, or Charlie Hebdo or whatever he wanted. But the people criticizing us for poking fun in that way, and yes, using the imago of George Floyd, they, they can't have it both ways. You can't, you can't have both things simultaneously. It can't be all right for him, but not for me, or me and not for him. I think that's right. I think what they would say about that image, that particular image, is that even if people do misunderstand it, it is dangerous to put out that kind of imagery because it, it means that racists will applaud it and people like that and, that, and it will permeate throughout society. That is the argument in a nutshell, really. Racists with Charlie, it is. I personally, I have to admit, I have a weakness for, I'm quite fond of Holocaust deniers. I, I have to admit this because they do make me laugh. But, I mean, if you ever met a Holocaust denier in real life, it's funny. I, I've never, I've never met one, but the, the, the fantastic. Mental, well, the mental gymnastics you must go through to disregard so much evidence, uh, so much historical data. Um, there is something funny, ludicrous about that. It's it's spectacular. It's actually seriously like meeting a really huge Hollywood star. I've done both things and they're almost exactly the same in that you are kicking people under the table because you can't restrain your excitement. So I, I admit I have peculiar taste, but I'm, I'm quite fond of, of the racist kind of reactions we get sometimes because sometimes, yes, racists do applaud us. But that generally lasts about 10 days. And then we do something that annoys <laughs> them <laughs> and they start sending us their views, which tend to be very, very lacking in, in deeds and disappointed. I think the, the racists who applaud you clearly don't read the magazine regularly, shall, shall we say? That can't be the case, can it? No, they, they don't. I think the groups who would have most, I think a, a, a seriously, seriously uh, believing Catholic would really struggle to be able to bear Charlie. Yep. I would say we're not always brilliant on uh, issues around feminism. And okay. We're getting much, much better. And certainly the demographic of the team has changed in that direction in a much better way. But yeah, if, if you secretly lie awake at night thinking of bad things happening to people of color, Charlie Hebdo is not the magazine for you. You're not going to enjoy it. 
<laughs> we'll be making quite a lot of fun of you. And in my case, you know, with a certain zest. Well, I think that's the perfect note to end on, Robert. So thank you so much for my your time. My pleasure. I, I, a good time. I really appreciate it. You've been listening to Culture Wars with Andrew Doyle and Robert McLean Wilson. Do check out Robert's articles on the Charlie Hebdo website. A few of them are in English, and if you're bilingual, you can read them all. I have attempted to read them, but believe me, GCSE-level French only gets you so far. Uh, particularly when it comes to the nuances of satire, they do get lost, rather. Anyway, make sure that you like and subscribe and all the rest of it. And if you're interested, please do check out my articles at www.spiked-online.com. Bye for now. Thank you.